to the metrics and why are they important? The metrics define the parameters in which the team is operating. So we really want these metrics to help the team understand how to go fast, predictably, and really well. We've got eight metrics that we're talking about. The first one is velocity. That's very familiar, although how we calculate it and how we measure it may be in a slightly different way than you're familiar with. We're also going to add in something called work capacity. Each one of these metrics I started collecting as a result of questions that either team members or managers or someone, some leader in the organization started asking me. And so they're all there to answer certain questions as you'll see as we move through the presentation. Velocity and work capacity are not comparable between two different scrum teams, but they are uh, a good indication of how the team is doing within itself. But using velocity, and work capacity, and some other observations, we've got the remaining six. Focus factor, which tells us the rate at which the team is converting effort into value. We have measures of adopted and found work. These are comparable across teams because they're calculated as percentages of the team's commitment which then leads us to a targeted value increase. Targeted value increase is what we use to determine if the team has already hit hyperproductivity or not. And finally, we have accuracy of estimation and accuracy of commit that help the product owner create a more realistic roadmap moving forward. The top two are not comparable between teams. The bottom six are. They're fully portable. So if your question is, which team do I spend the resources on or which team do I go help, you'll be able to look at their metrics and tell. I decided to represent these as user stories. So I, as a Scrum product owner who's trying to create an accurate roadmap for my future releases, need a reliable metric on which to base my assumptions about the rate of progress that the team is going to have so that I and our leaders can make intelligent decisions. And here's the formula for it. It's simply the sum of the original estimates of all approved cards, just like you saw in the animation with the, of the bank on the planning board earlier. Summing up those original estimates gives you your team's velocity. So here we have three cards, uh, the ones that we saw estimated a little bit earlier. Now we're moving to the end of the sprint. And the product owner gets the chance to say, do you approve of it or not? And so we're going to collect those original estimates and ask the product owner, do you approve of the work that the team did on priority one? If they say yes, then you add that in. Priority two, yes, you add it in. Priority three, product owner rejects that card. It was not completed to his or her satisfaction. So that five does not get added into that team's velocity. So in this case, the team's velocity is an 11. Then we have work capacity, which is again measured in story points only. And this one answers the user story. I, as a scrum master who's trying to coach the team toward hyper productivity, need a way to measure how much work the team can do in a given sprint, whether it results in an approved card or not, so that I can quantify my team's entire capability, ask intelligent questions, and take action to op optimize the effort to value conversion. And here's how we sum that up. It's simply the sum of all work reported during a sprint against any card. This gives us more of a measure of the true horsepower of the team, not just those items that were approved by the, the Scrum product owner, but also any items that the team worked on. Knowing the team's true capacity gives us an opportunity to figure out what percentage of that capacity is being turned into value. So coming back to our example, on priority one in a daily stand-up meeting, we would say, what did we achieve today on the priority one card? You may say, well, we did a couple of things, item one and item two. Now, if item one and item two had been brought to the planning meeting as an independent card, and the team had been asked to solve them as a user story, they would have evaluated those two items and compared it to their story point scale, which is the same thing we're asking them to do here. Look at your story point scale, look at your touchstone cards, and tell us how many points to put on those two items worth of work. In this situation, they chose a five. Now, I want to point out that the original estimate of the entire card was an eight. And one of the pitfalls that many teams fall into is that if you've got an eight point card and you've got five days to do it, and you're feeling pretty good about how things are going, people tend to think fractionally. So it's going pretty well, so I'm going to report 20% or 25%. So they might come into a planning meeting and report two points per day for two or three days, trying to get it to equal eight points. What we're trying to do in this situation is take that percentage thinking or that fractional thinking away from them and ask them instead to compare the true complexity of the work that they achieved. And that leads us to a better understanding of how truly complex the card was.
And so by the end of the sprint, we'll now be able to sum those daily answers up and find out that against priority number one, they reported a total of eight points. Against priority two and against priority three, they report different values. Now, we can ask the question, product owner, do you approve of priority one? If so, then we add the eight to the estimate, from the estimate to velocity, and we add the eight from the reported work to work capacity. But on the third card, which you recall got rejected, the five does not go toward velocity, but the seven does go toward work capacity. Several teams I've worked with, they always want to know, where are my points? This is one way that I, I chose to answer that, but even more importantly, I think, is it gives us a true estimate of the team's horsepower. We do want to know how much the team is capable of, and a measure of the effectiveness of the team is if they can do 17 points, but they can only do 11 points conversion into velocity, that is a problem in focus. So we've changed the way we think about the focus factor using these metrics. And now, exactly the, the metric Jeff brings up, focus factor, is the next one we'll discuss. But just sort of foreshadowing a little bit the, uh, the look at the RoboScrum spreadsheet that we're going to look at toward the end of the presentation, this is a chart that's part of RoboScrum, but you could, you could chart this yourself. You could chart it any way you want to. What you'll see are the two lines. The red line indicates hyperproductivity. The green line indicates where the team started. So what we're looking at is you can see the velocity line increasing as the team gets better. And you can see the work capacity line. Now, this particular snapshot was taken from an actual team. And the last snapshot, or the last sprint, was not quite complete. So that's why you see the work capacity line dipping below the velocity line. That's not normally a situation you would find yourself in. So what you'll typically see is that the work capacity line will meet the velocity line and sort of bump off of it and bounce up and down. As you, as you move higher and higher. So now back to focus factor. The issue that I was trying to resolve here was, how do we measure the rate at which the team turns effort into value? So here's the user story for it. I, as a member of the leadership team who is not a member of any Scrum delivery team, need a way to measure how much of the team's bandwidth results in deployable product in a cross-team comparable way so that I can uh, actively engage sub-optimized teams, make intelligent allocation of resources, and so forth. And here is our, uh, our formula. It's a simple ratio of velocity to work capacity. So all we have to do is take from before our 11 and our 17, and we're simply going to stack them up and find out that this team is 64.7% effective at turning effort into value. So focus now has become a focus factor for the team and it's an indicator not only of how the teams function, but an indicator of the measure of disruption of the team, which is very often, probably 80% of the time, a problem with the management of the company, that the company is not focused. So we're getting a metric that when you hand it to the leadership, they have to really think not only about the team, but how well the company is supporting that scrum. How about that 64.7%? Is that good? I don't know. Well, there was a guy who, uh, who could tell us. His name was Edwards Deming. But one of the things that uh, Deming taught us is that when you attempt to force a non-deterministic system into greater than a 20% variance range, then you're going to wind up actually causing short bursts of stability at that higher performance range. But then it's going to be very wide, very broad, destructive swings after that. So he's really teaching us that what we should do is accept 20% failure is going to be OK. That's got to be OK. And if you accept 20% failure, then what you'll wind up getting in the 80% that does succeed is worth well more than you would have gotten had you insisted on 100% perfection. And so using that, we want to start measuring our focus factor and many of the other metrics against the 80% rule. And we want to see that the focus factor is at about 80%. If you go much higher than 80%, you're probably not being a very good corporate citizen in your, your corporate culture. If you go below that, you're probably being too randomized by these external forces. And so we've got to be sure that we control that for you.